My name is Alan Schulz. I'm the historian for the Fellowship of Free Thought, a nonprofit PhDT organization. Um, we have an interesting program this morning. That's why our tables are somewhat set out initially. Uh, we've got an activity set up for everyone to go through. Just a moment, let's do that a little bit later. Um, today's topic is cultural evolution and religion. We will explore how things such as memes <coughs> and urban legends influence cultural evolution and why this is important to the community. First, what's a meme? A meme is an idea, behavior, or style that spreads from person to person within a culture. While genes transmit biological information, memes are said to transmit ideas and belief information. A meme acts as a unit for carrying cultural ideas, symbols, or practices, which can be transmitted from one mind to another through writing, speech, gestures, rituals, or other imitable phenomena. The word meme was popularized, not introduced to us, by Dawkins in his 76 book, The Selfish Gene, to emphasize commonality with genes. Dawkins coined the term meme by shortening uh, mimeme, which derives from the Greek word mimima, something imitated. Dawkins wrote that evolution depended not on, not on the particular chemical basis of genetics, but only on the existence of a self-replicating unit of transmission, a replicator. In, in the case of biological in, uh, evolution, it was the gene. For Dawkins, the meme exemplified another self-replicating unit with potential significance in explaining human behavior and cultural evolution. Some have theorized that phenomena such as urban legends, for instance, and religion, have had cultural resilience because of their ability to transmit ideas, especially if they have a moral teaching or idea that resonates culturally, like memes. Urban legends are popular stories alleged to be true and passed from individual to individual via oral or written or email you know, communication. Typically said stories concern outlandish media. Humorous, terrifying, or supernatural events. Uh, events which, in the telling, always seem to happen to someone else, other than the telling. In that respect, an urban legend is very similar to, if not a specific type of complex meme. In an urban legend, in lieu of evidence, the conveyor of an urban legend relies on narrative flourishes and or reference to trustworthy sources. I heard this from a friend and a friend and a friend, or this really happened to my sister's co-worker's hairdresser. To buttress its credibility, sometimes, but not always, there's an implied moral message. So I'll give you an example, then I'll pass. You all for one. Um, a friend of a friend. You heard this. <laughs> had a grandmother who was a little bit dotty. One day, Grandma had just bathed her miniature poodle, Pierre. Pierre and was about to uh, and was about to towel dry him, towel dry him, when the phone rang. It was her daughter reminding her that they had arranged to meet for lunch a half hour earlier. Grandma apologized for being late and said she'd be there as quickly as she could. As she began to towel dry Pierre, it dawned on her that there was a quicker way to do it: a microwave. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> so she put her beloved pet inside the oven, she set the dial to the frost, and switched it on. Oh. A half minute later, as Grandma was donning her coat to leave, she heard a muffled explosion in the kitchen. Oh. Oh. Here, the poodle was no more. So, question. Why would anyone believe this was true? Anyone? Anything? It's such a good story, exactly. It's got staying power. Why this particular story would persist? Again, anyone? Reverse <laughs> finger. It's a good story. Okay. This particular legend has all the classic markers of an urban legend as well as parables for all the exhibitions. Um, there, <laughs> there's so much that we can relate to, and there's a moral. There is a moral story behind it. There are no real shortcuts, right? Really, no shortcuts. Uh, there's also an ugly stereotype of uh, an elderly woman with senility, but we don't have to get into that too much. Um, but a lot of times it plays on our fears. It 
Does anyone in the audience have a particular urban legend? Come on, it's a lot of fun. The babysitter on LSD putting the baby in the oven. Um, babysitter on LSD putting the baby in the oven. The traveler to Mexico who brings home a chihuahua and it's really a big rat. Flashlights as someone who's driving a night without the lights on, that's really a gang initiation, and they're going to turn around and kill you. Oh, yeah. Any others? Okay, you, uh, you go to a bar, uh, somebody puts something in your drink, you wake up eight hours later in a bathtub full of ice, and they take your picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so how do we know? All right, so anyone remember Little Mikey? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the kid from Life Serial, um, to my name, he'll eat anything. Um, there was a great story about how he ate a bag of Pop Rocks, and then slammed a bottle of Coke, and his stomach blew up, leading to his ultimate demise. Now, that's all I remember hearing until I did a little bit of research on this thing. Kids all over began, now this is back in the 70s, 80s, kids all over began to try this endeavor to a point where they were literally making themselves sick, right? Their stomachs didn't go up, they just ingested enough soda and candy to make themselves sick, right? Okay, so eventually sales of Pop Rocks plummeted due to this. General Foods pulled the candy in 1980. The rumor died with the candy, which eventually resurfaced a few, a few years later when the patent changed hands. And so that's the only reason you see Pop Rocks being sold now. All right. Oh, so the Mentos. It's saying, well, same thing with Mentos, exactly. Yeah. And you know, if you remember, the Mythbusters did eventually take that on it, that, that, that as well. So can it really, you know, cause your stomach to explode? No. Okay. So I'm going to do one more. Let's see if y'all get this. If I say Richard Gere. Yeah. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> What comes to people's mind? Anyone still think of a small rodent used for unnatural purposes? Oh. Right? Terrible. All right, for you that don't know, just, just Google it. <laughs> there has never been a shred of evidence to link this story to actual events. In the 20 years it circulated, never one witness. 20 years, not a nurse, not a doctor, no one. Medical or otherwise, right? Uh, that has confirmed the story. It didn't really taint <laughs> the gear name, um, but it did have some slanderous effects on the LGBT community because of its implications. And if you think not, all you have to do is listen to some of the creatures not only in the U.S. but especially now in Uganda and other places in Africa. Right? Okay. So, uh, assuming stomach that, the gear story bears every hallmark of an urban legend, unverifiable sources, a friend of a friend, no credible witnesses, no third party verification, dodgy sources drawn from weak friend of a friend of a third cousin's twice removed aunt's hairdresser, exactly. Rumors that wouldn't even qualify as hearsay. Right? So while the basic narrative has stayed consistent through the years, smaller details have varied and mutated exactly as one would expect in a retold uh, manner a thousand times over, just like you see in some legendary hero or legend tales of God-man, or God in the form of man. Imagine a, a messianic figure tortured to death on a cross, etc., then seen, depending on your version, a few days later in multiple places by a conflicting number of people and not credibly attested to for over 40 years until after the event. With, virgin, with versions ranging from two people to hundreds, mutations like other urban legends. The problem is that followers of such a story encroach on other people's rights to happiness, all because of unverifiable attestation. Because there's something timeless in the story, a story of hope, a moral picture of sacrifice, hard to fight that. How about Let There Be Light, the magic story associated with creation? Interesting story, full of logical and factual holes, but 
exciting, easily transmitted. We've been told that all legends or myths have some grain of truth in them. But what if that's completely false? What if the myths gain credibility just because they're, they're repeated over and over and over again by enough people? And we merely just assume that some portion of it is true. Facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. But without a message that sticks, we've seen the masses really don't care. The meme for blind faith secures its own perpetuation by the simple unconscious ex expedient of discouraging rational inquiry. But memes resonate. But I wonder how many of our natural and scientific explanations are lost because they don't have those wonderful stories that stay. So with that, welcome. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's see, we've got um, the faithless companions. Now we will have, it, it, it is going to be karaoke style if you all want to follow and sing along. Um, we'll take it on the run. Justin uh, suggested this song mostly because of uh, one line in it which suggests passing things from generation to generation and just believing them because you've heard them over and over from a friend. A friend, a friend. Um, but we, we took it one step further and it kind of cross-culturally evolved it. So uh, once you recognize it and can get the gist, uh, sing along. Then what you're going to do is hand it to the person to your left. So 
going to, everybody has somebody to your left at the table you're at. Um, and what they're going to do is draw a picture of the phrase. So here's an attempt uh, to draw the dish ran away from the spoon. Um, so after the person draws the picture of the phrase, then they'll fold back the top of the paper so that you can't see what the phrase was, and then they'll pass it on to the next person. Um, so the next person, all they can see is this picture, um, and what they need to do is figure out what the phrase was that uh, generated this picture. So they're going to write the phrase, um, here's the guess, and a tongue depressor to walking. Uh, <laughs> so they'll, they'll write the phrase, and then they'll fold back the paper to hide the picture, and now we're basically back at the, the earlier stage in the cycle where uh, we're passing a phrase to the next person, and they'll need to draw a picture. So you go back and forth between pictures and phrases. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, as for what phrase to start with, uh, you might try things from pop culture, like uh, the nursery rhyme sorts of things. Um, for fun, you might try some things from science, like maybe the universe started with a big bang, or uh, all of us are descended from a common ancestor. Um, you might try some ideas from religion. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Jonah lived inside of a great fish. I almost said whale. Um, you know, any sort of random thing that you want to think of. So uh, have everybody think for a moment of uh, what phrase they want to see, how well it survives as it's going around the table. So uh, they can come up with something. <coughs> yourself getting a backlog in front of you. Um, let's see, I was going to advise pass to your left. Uh, um, it doesn't matter. discussion about uh, what, uh, what happened in these. So, um, one of the reasons I do this is it gives us this great sort of data set of uh, examples of different things that we've tried out and seen how well they pass on. You know, it's kind of an odd uh, process where you have to pass on from phrase to picture, back to phrase, back to picture. Um, but, uh, but still, it gives us a, a data set, and, and then we can ask the question, well, are there any ways of doing science about this stuff? Can we predict which of these ideas are more likely to pass on, which ideas are less likely to pass on? So, um, it seems like we might be able to pick out some, pick, some features of these drawings or these phrases that are likely to get passed on pretty well. Um, and so I guess the few that might be involved in the uh, uh, addition spoon example here, the fact that there was motion involved, the fact that there were two agents involved, um, maybe the round shape of the dish, maybe those features would pass on pretty well if we tried this, but lots of other things, like they were running away, stuff like that, probably wouldn't pass along so well, um, or that it was a dish, it's hard to draw a dish accurately. Oh. So, so it seems like there might be some ways of sort of predicting what's likely to stay stable and what's uh, not so likely to stay stable. So I'd like to invite some people to volunteer. Did you notice some things that, uh, that seem like, uh, you know, and I guess maybe think of hypotheses about what do you think would be likely to stay stable in this game? Yeah, yeah. We had one that was um, the dog ate my homework, and it uh -huh. stayed the same for about four or five things, and then somebody <laughs> <laughs> oh, my drawing, then derailed it. 
Right. So, but it seems like that the dog that stayed pretty stable, um, and at least for a while, the dog ate my homework. Yeah. Anybody have any ideas? Why would dog stay pretty stable? They're easy to draw, easy to recognize. Homer said stable too. The only reason they've got lots of every drawing before this one has homework. Uh -huh. yeah. And then this last one was a little My homework was already in the mouth. <laughs> 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 the guy was upset and there's a dog sitting there. <laughs> so lots of them drew the dog prior to eating the homework and Dallin actually drew the dog having eaten the homework. And that's what I missed it. Hey, that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> And other ideas, hypotheses. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have one here that was very stable. It was uh, if a range of sports. Uh -huh. Good. And I don't know, I, I think maybe the ubiquitous of that slogans uh -huh. perhaps contributed to uh, the community state. Good. Yeah, the fact that we've heard this phrase before and you get that sort of feeling, ah, uh, that's probably what they meant once you get that sort of aha feeling. Now I understand what this picture was about. Um, so how did they draw it? Is it like one raining cloud and then an arrow and then a bigger raining cloud or something yeah, like that? Somebody put that an umbrella. Is it over there? Yeah, yeah. Like two or three yeah. clouds. Yeah. Cloud. Cloud. It actually changed once and then changed back. <laughs> <laughs> that one stayed stable. And raining, it seems like it's like Dodd, where you have this really canonical drawing for a cloud with raindrops falling mm -hmm. from it. But I'm not sure pouring, that seems like it would be a hard thing to draw, so I'm impressed that you guys managed to keep that stable. Uh, two going around. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I bet the money aspect stuck around for a while, but the rest of it went away. Is that right? Yeah. Girls. Yeah. And everything else morphed around this, whatever the narrative structure was. Yeah, yeah. Yes. On my Jesus, I guess, the Grim Reaper. Thinking, going back to the, you get what you pay for, the things that are solid, concrete things like money, you know, are much easier than concepts like pay. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that seems to make sense. Anything that involves some sort of concrete event to go, I don't know, love doesn't talk. Well, sometimes I guess it involves a sort of concrete event, but it often doesn't. Anybody have a love thing? Those often come up in these. You didn't have a love thing that often, partly because you just draw the balance of the part, and, and it stays really stably once it arises. Yeah? Uh, this one was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Uh -huh. <laughs> I found this one interesting. You were talking about how you know the things like the dogs, the common images kind of stayed the same. Well, this one where it, had, it involved a horse, and the horse there's a horse in each each drawing, but the concept just totally changed by the end. It starts out never look a gift horse in the mouth, and uh, then there's the drawing of the person not looking at, at the horse, and uh, I was actually the one that had to put the sentence in there. I couldn't figure out what that was. I, I put horse blinder, and so someone, someone drew a horse with like a little blinder on it. Someone, someone put pirate horse. <laughs> So you always had the horse and some sort of abstraction and vision in those days, but uh, it sort of simplified down to pirate horse. It's like horse and abstracted vision, that's, uh, that's a pretty stable one. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you also, I had suggested that people might try either science-y things or religion-y things. Um, did anybody uh, do that? Anybody want to report what happened? Yeah. Yeah. It stayed stable. It stayed stable. It 
so it lets the water perfectly. This one has uh, Newton's discovered gravity when Apple phone is dead. And then it says, Gra uh, gravity discovered, then it says the apple does not fall far, far from the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's interesting that we took a very narrative description of a scientific story and that part sticks, the, the apple following the And people have other science or religion ways? Yeah. Well, of course, we don't know what the same about that. Holy cow. Yeah. 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 Rose on the third day. Uh -huh. I drew the cave with the stone rolling away, but that was interpreted as a bridge. So now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, since we have limited time here, um, let's see. One thing I wanted to say about this is the band thought that this might be an awesome source of lyrics, so hopefully you all don't mind uh, passing that paper so the band can uh, make up a song based yeah, on our. I can't wait to hear Pirate Lords, by the way. <laughs> So we were sort of just imagining how would you use science as our little game here. Um, what we're going to do after having the band sing another song for us um, is uh, talk about uh, people that actually are doing science with how various religious and scientific stories get passed on um, and what the, the features are that affect the long-term survival of those things. Uh, but first, the band is going to present to us a, a scientific story presented in about as catchy a way as one probably could. So we'll go ahead and do that now. I have the lyrics again. or die. And you feel that you've had quite enough. Just remember that you're standing on the planet to hold. You can give me the key. Come on. The sun is the source of all the power.
religion, or the question of whether religion is natural. So, um, so this presentation um, builds off of the activity that we've already done. You know, we're talking about all these different memes and, and how they change and sort of mutate you know, from person to person. And, and really, you know, <coughs> religion is, is mostly just built up of these, these memes. And so the question arises is, well, if we can, if we can sit around and analyze uh, these different these memes, these concepts, and these symbols, could we do that um, with religion, which is nothing but you know, systems of symbols? So could we apply science to religion? And typically, you know, whenever you think of religion and science getting together, it's a very confrontational type of situation. Um, you know, especially in, in situations where you know, the scientific discoveries uh, directly contradict some, some deeply held religious beliefs, as, as in the case with uh, creation and evolution. Um, but, but could we actually use the methods of science to, to analyze and, and really look at religion and, and really um, create sort of a new uh, field of study within science? Like if you think about it, there, there really are, um, there, there's no ology out there. Right? there there's theology, right? the study of God, uh, but that's sort of a different, different thing altogether. Um, there's no like, science of religion, so to speak. Um, and so just asked me to um, present, uh, based on this, this paper, it's a, it's a review by um, Robert McCauley and, and Emma Cohen that, uh, that basically make the case for a cognitive science of religion. And they sort of go through all the different ways in which um, this, is, this field is justified, but with the with different ways in which you can analyze uh, religion. Um, and uh, they, they sort of contrast what they want to do with what, what philosophy has done traditionally in regards to religion, which is just sort of looking at the different um, religious concepts that exist and trying to uh, in interpret them and sort of give them the benefit of the doubt and set them all up um, sort of in, in contrast to, other, uh, to each other, which is kind of like metaphysical bug collecting, you might, you might say. And, and a lot of the same criticisms, and criticisms were made about biology in its early years, and it was just, oh, you're, you're just finding these species and you're sticking them on the board, and, uh, and you don't do anything else. You don't try to explain how these, these species arose um, and, and why the differences exist. And of course, you know, biology has progressed significantly um, since the introduction of evolution has allowed us to, uh, to examine uh, the, the differences between different biological species. So perhaps we can get past the, the, uh, the sort of the old school method of just um, collecting sort of metaphysical bugs, as it were, um, and sticking them on board and then just not doing anything else with them. So, um, so what they propose is that um, basically there, there are two um, social sciences that exist right now that, are, uh, that do have within their legitimate scopes um, a, a way of analyzing and studying religion uh, right now. So there's cultural anthropology and there's also psychology. So you know, what, goes, what goes on uh, within different societies as a culture, as cultures, and, and clearly religion is, is very much built into uh, different cultures. Um, you know, this is a very obvious thing that we see today, but the culture in which you are born is likely to determine the religious orientation that you have. Right? So that's just, that's just a very obvious thing. And then also psychology, the, 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 the thoughts and the, the different mental states that, that go on in different religious individuals, um, and, and not just you know, in their daily lives, but also in the religious experiences that they have. Um, and again, the difference here is that they, they're not seeking to just in, interpret these experiences and, um, and hold them up as, you know, each being legitimate or something like that, but to really get in and, you know, aside from whether their religious beliefs are true or not, but to explain why they hold those religious beliefs, how they got them, uh, why they're being passed along, and why are they so pervasive. Uh, and so they, they draw a lot of their um, inspiration in this paper uh, from uh, William James, who is um, pretty famous for giving uh, a presentation, or a series of presentations, uh, as part of the Gifford Lectures uh, in Scotland, um, which he titled The Varieties of Religious, Religious Experience. And he was a philosopher and a uh, psychologist who was making an argument at the time, at the, at the turn of the 20th century, that religion is something that should be studied. And, and you know, back then it was uh, it was really considered as you know, just this sort of 
mystical thing that just sort of happened, you know, in churches and in people's private lives, and the science really didn't have much to say about it. And William James is different from that significantly. Um, there are a couple points that, that he made in his in, in his lectures uh, that the, the authors of, of this review take uh, some issue with, um, where he emphasized significantly the emotional effects of religion um, as being important to study, and we should not dismiss those, and, and the authors of this paper agree with that. Um, but he also sort of dismissed the experiences of ordinary religious believers. He, he wanted to focus on um, the, the, I guess, the, the profound religious believers, the, the really important people, the people that, that draw a lot of attention, the, the Joan of Arcs, the Mother Teresas, um, etc. Um, whereas the authors of the paper would say that, no, we shouldn't be analyzing the experiences of all religious believers because they're all having religious experiences that are interesting and, and meaningful and help explain why their, their religious beliefs um, occur and why they um, uh, proceed as they do. Now, I, I also wanted to draw attention to the fact that Carl Sagan, uh, 83 years later, um, gave a, another talk uh, as part of the Gifford Lecture um, that was later released as a book called The Varieties of Scientific Experience, which is also really great. Um, and in it, he, uh, he actually does sort of echo uh, James, some of James's points. Uh, he spends quite a lot of time talking about the emotional effects of, of religion and, and other things, how these emotional effects are, in fact, explainable by science. He, you know, he appeals to the, the, the different hormones and the different molecules that, that we have characterized um, that, that are affecting our brains all the time. He says, you know, these are things that we can study, and this is not something that's, that's um, off limits for us to do. Um, and he also, in, in his lectures, he, he presented um, sort of a, a religious present, a presentation of the scientific wonder of the natural world. Um, and uh, most of his talk was, in fact, just showing different uh, photographs of, of different galaxies and nebulas and things like that, and just basically talking about how amazing and wonderful that was. So that when we talk about a natural sort of approach to religion, that's one of the ones that, that springs to mind most really for, I think, for most people. It certainly does for me. Um, one of the other things that we can uh, be, be interested in is looking at the epidemiology of, re of religion. Now, it, the, the, if these memes are inheritable and, and are transmissible, then uh, anybody who's read The God Virus by Don Ray knows that this is a very interesting concept. Uh, and we can look at how these, these individual religious units and these symbols, you know, why is it that the heart symbol, for example, is so pervasive, it's so instantly recognizable. Why is it that the, 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 the Christian cross symbol uh, is so pervasive and so instantly recognizable? And so when we look at um, individual sort of religious traditions, it, it's, it's worth looking at them as just aggregations of individual inheritable psychological units um, that are passed on in different configurations. Now, one way to think about this is, you know, how these uh, religious traditions and, and other religious beliefs are passed on is based on whatever uh, relative advantages they confer. So, and there are different ways of thinking about this, right? So we can think about how uh, a particular religion might benefit the individual. So let's say you had one person with a particular religious and self-identification, it might um, provide some sort of a benefit in a situation where there's a, a wide diversity of other religious traditions out there in the culture. Maybe, maybe this religion um, helps this person uh, succeed in a way um, that maybe these others don't. Or you could think about it in terms of a group effect, right? Um, a lot of biological effects are, are measured as group effects, and we can look at you know, what if, if this entire population is affiliated with a particular religion, and what, what effects and what advantages are there. And we can also look at um, the, the mimetic effects of how, how religions transition from one person to the next and, uh, and move all, all the way through a population. So these are really interesting things to think about. And what, they, what the author suggests is that, um, however this cognitive theory of, of religion, of this, this science, however this works, but it, it should concentrate on uh, looking at the similarities among the different mental representations um, that, that people have uh, regarding their religious materials, and also the cognitive explanations of those experiences. You know, why, why are those experiences take place in their minds? And then also looking at the implications of these cognitive theories um, for the explanation of the religious belief. Um, 
and, and in practice as well as the, the different features of their religious system. So um, what does that look like in actuality when you put together a cognitive representation of an actual religious system? They suggest it looks something very much like this. Um, this is um, uh, one of those um, Rube Goldberg. Rube Goldberg mechanisms, you know, where it's, it's like, it, this, is, this is actually the fly swatter here. This is the Rube Goldberg uh, fly swatter. And certainly there's there are simpler ways of doing it, but all these individual parts all sort of, you know, they've been carried along and, and worked together, and it actually doesn't work. Uh, it just, you know, maybe not be the most efficient or, you know, uh, best way of doing it. And yet we can still describe and explain, you know, how this works. So um, this is what they suggest to be the, uh, the standard cognitive analysis of, of any religion, um, so, or religious belief. So what are the origins? of the religious belief, and they suggest that it's very often um, associated with uh, an explanation by appeal to agency. Uh, so a lot of beliefs um, arise because you think that something is doing something out there, whether it's a force for good, like an angel, a force for evil, like a demon. Um, and they also want to ask questions about persistence, what provides the persistence of certain religious beliefs. Um, and they suggest that in, in many cases, religions provide a, a reinforcement through false positives. Uh, and one example is glossolalia. So, you know, people have a belief in, you know, speaking in tongues, and they come together and speak in tongues. And, you know, they're, they're, they're reinforced all the time that this is something that is real. Um, um, and uh, they, they look at different suggest selective pressures for, you know, what facilitates the culture transmission of these beliefs. Um, the, the, the different pressures would be readily recognizable. They would have minimal counterintuitive in, in, uh, inferences. So the, the least number of things that you have to really struggle to think about is, is the best. Um, these are easily remembered, read, readily communicable, and particularly motivating. Um, those are the, the certain selective pressures that they suggest. Right? So the question I want to raise just at the end of this is, well, <clears throat> so these are really interesting ways to look at other religious traditions and see what makes them successful or not. Um, but we can also sort of apply that to ourselves and say, well, what are we doing here? You know, if, if we take all this as of what we're doing here and put this under the banner of free thought, can we apply the same analysis? You know, we certainly could. Um, and so then do, you know, so just going through their same analysis, are the representations that we have of free thought easily recognizable in society? Um, does, does free thought require few counterintuitive inferences? Um, does our free thinking beliefs easily remembered? Uh, and is free thought easily communicated to other people? And does free thought provide a sufficient level of motivation uh, for people? And these, these are all questions that we need to ask ourselves. But but certainly these are the, the these are the ways in which that the, the author suggests that we should be analyzing other religions. And I think we should take some time at least to, to look at ourselves. Not not necessarily to say that we need to change what we're doing, but just to be aware of of, of how you know how we sort of stack up in a, in a cognitive scientific way. So thank you. about memetics, memes. If anybody here is all on Facebook, out of curiosity. Wow. Okay. So say one of your friends posts a video, and then one of your other friends posts that same video. And their friends, and their friends. That's an example of a memetic idea being transferred. The cultural transference of ideas. Okay. Now we are going to talk about <coughs> memes that the kids made up. So an example of a short-lived meme was the burping meme. <laughs> Ray getting blasphemed for 
You know, the kid thinks it's funny and tries to burp himself. Uh, one for the adults, the short-lived sober meme. <laughs> uh, the pencil behind the ear meme, and the talent show burping meme. And now for the long-lived attempt at a meme. Rowan's going to demonstrate the attempted long-living meme, which is the... Sugar-licking meme. Sugar-licking meme. Okay. Direct me. It takes too long after a while, and you know how kids get all hyper after sugar. <laughs> I think this is a meme that can live on. It's like a long time. What have you done? Right. <laughs> and in the other classroom, they were working on flying paper airplanes and trying to increase distance by different modifications. Here's the hero clock though. Um, we first started with like normal paper and it totally didn't work. <laughs> so we moved on to hard, heavier paper and this is my airplane. It's uh, Jason figured out that longer wings fly better and a long haul also works. So I combined the two and gave it some aerodynamics. And it kind of flies. <laughs> Show us. Show us. Show us. Islamic Association of Collin County and Plano. They're doing an open house next week. 
Um, so we're going to inoculate, not indoctrinate our kids, by <laughs> informing them of all the stuff. It's actually a two and a half hour thing. You do it quite often. Um, inform them, informing them what everything is about. And I think that is all. But speaking of themes, I have heard a rumor that this is not going to be the last FOF baby that will be coming. So, I'm not quite sure, but it's Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's actually very interesting. You know, we, uh, we tend to be called the uh, Fellowship of Free Thought, and we argued about that name for a long time, and I, I'm, I'm almost ready to go ahead and uh, Propose a motion to change it to the Fellowship of Fertility. No one's heard the wall. So with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and invite uh, our executive director and expecting dad, Zachary Moore. website is foundationofbelief.org. Signing up to be a, a regular member, you can donate as little as five dollars a month. Uh, we've already done a lot for the foundation just as a local partner group and they're very appreciative. Uh, we are at the top of the list. Uh, the, the next, the second uh, to us is way below us in terms of money that we've actually con contributed to the foundation and they're very appreciative. So we have bragging rights for that. I'd also like to claim bragging rights for the most number of members uh, to the Foundation of Belief. So please, if you can, uh, go and, and register yourself as a member. You get to pick uh, from a lot of really great secular charities. Um, these are the, uh, the beneficiaries that have just come online for quarter three of this year. Uh, we have really great ones, Wildlife Conservation Network, Camp Quest, of course. Um, is actually returning. The Uganda Humanist Schools Trust, Uganda desperately needs humanists and secular charities there more than any place else. Um, Center for Biological Diversity, uh, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, PFLAG, Peace Direct Responsible Charity. Um, they also have a, what's called Challenge the Gap, in which they find um, religious charities that are doing good humanist work without proselytizing. And so they, they, have, they have that ability so you can actually um, donate some of your money or direct some of your donations to actually supporting some of these, basically the good guys, the religious organizations that are out there doing good humanist work. Uh, if you want to support that, right now it's the International Assistance Mission. It's a group that's doing really great work in Afghanistan. Uh, some of their members have actually been killed uh, doing what they're doing. So, uh, and also the Foundation of the Core Budget, you can contribute to that. Um, during this donation drive, every new membership is registered to receive, registered to, to potentially win an iPad 2. Also, every $20, so every increments of $20 that you donate is also get you another registration to win that iPad 2. Um, and when you do uh, sign up to be a member, please list the FOF Dallas as your affiliate group because all the donations that you make as a member to the foundation, we also get credit for. So we've got to keep our bragging rights up as the highest donating local partnership. Um, so definitely make sure you do that when you go there. Um, uh, Zach? Yes. Okay, there is another opera, Cocktails for a Cause, this month. Yes. Um, and Jay has chosen to have that go to the uh, Foundation Beyond Belief. And that, that's been a way we can 
come out and have a drink. I hear there's rumors about riding on boats okay. on Dave's Lake. So <laughs> we, we've donated a lot of money to Foundation Beyond the Lake through this event. So come help and keep, us, keep it up. Yeah, that cocktails for cause right here in your program in July and August events. So make sure you sign up for that too. It was, really it was changed to the 30th. Oh, it was changed? I don't know if it's, yeah. Changing the time? Yes, I did. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, I also want to mention, of course, uh, you know, the costs of free thought uh, doing what we do here. Um, of course, you have to pay rent to, to rent this facility out. Uh, we have to buy chilling supplies. Um, we have a, a meager equipment budget. Most of the stuff we use is, is currently borrowed. And we also have to, um, to put ourselves out there as a, as a social outreach group and as a charitable outreach group. And that all takes uh, money and just sort of growing the organization. So if you could, uh, if you could donate uh, $30 or more per month, uh, we have a PayPal donation on our website and on Meetup. Uh, and also, time is, is something that we desperately need, as, as much as money. So if you can donate at least four hours of your time uh, coming out, helping support one or more of the events that we do here, um, especially this, this gathering, helping to, to get this, this going, that would be really helpful. Howard? I think you already know about this, but uh, your contributions are now tax-deductible. Yes, yes. And we've just received word from the Internal Revenue Service that our application for 501c3 status has been accepted. Yay. So we, everything that you donate is tax exempt, uh, including everything that you've donated since we've been an organization. So if you want to go back and do your redo, you make donations and write checks. Right. That way we can know who to do. Yes, people. yes. So please uh, write checks or have it, have it be trackable in some way if you want to have it. You want to put um, money in there, you know, cash. Put a note in there with your name on it. Right. So we can, we so we can keep track of it, so you can keep track of it for your time. By the way, if you're not going to use any of these envelopes, you can pass them up front so they'll be easier to collect. And Georgie? Let me just mention that uh, in order, you can deduct things. You can file a your whatever charitable contributions you made last year to us. You can uh, amend your 1040, and but you will need a letter from me. So I'll be working on that. Everybody that donated money that I have tracked, you'll get a letter. And then that you will be able to use to amend your 1040 for last year. Right. This year, everything from January 1st on is automatically deductible. And you'll also get a letter from that at the end of this year. Right. So any, any further questions about that, check with Georgine. She's our uh, very good treasurer here, and she's taking care of that. So. Thank you for coming. Uh, again, check out our meetup site and sign up for all the things, all the great things that are coming up. Uh, thanks to everyone who has volunteered to, to help this, uh, help make this uh, event a reality. And, uh, and we'll see you all in August. Oh. So for the public, Jamie, real quick. I'd like to make a quick announcement uh, about the number of babies that we're going to have coming in to the, the meetups as, as they come up. And one of the things that is very, very important to all of us, um, and should be very, very important to all of you, is that you have your Tdap vaccination. This is a vaccination that most adults do not get regularly. You need to get it every 10 years because that vaccinates you against uh, pertussis. Infants up to two years of age cannot be vaccinated against pertussis. And over 30,000 infants have died in the last year to, due to this. It's an epidemic right now. And these babies require our herd immunity. So this is a, a vaccination that most of your insurance, health insurance will cover. If you just go to CVS Pharmacy or Walgreens, they have it available. And it's a little shot. It's a little discomfort for you, but it can save a baby's life. So I know that that seems very self-serving since I have a baby here, but we have a lot of babies coming in. So get vaccinated so that you can protect, help protect our baby. It's called Tdap. It's the, the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Maybe we could even set up a vaccination drive here, potentially. Yeah. It would be awesome. So uh, just make sure if you haven't had that vaccination in the last 10 years, go and grab it because it can help uh, keep that spread of pertussis. Because pertussis for you is no big deal, but for an infant, it can kill them. So, all right. Okay. Sorry. One follow-up question because I had a tetanus like three years ago. Is that usually done as a cocktail? Or? Yes, it's a cocktail. So, so if you've had I a tetanus, you're good. It. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks everyone. Let's uh, set up for our potluck and we'll see you all again in August.